Good morning. Good morning. We come together in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We come together to strengthen our spirit and deepen our relationship with God. Now let us worship together.
unison prayer of confession. Ever-present God, our thoughts and hearts are muddled with the confusion of daily life. Our spiritual strengths are weak. Fill us anew. Strengthen us with your love. Through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? the kids, youth, to come on up. Good morning. It's a little early, I know. How are you guys doing today? Eh, eh. School started. I know Liam started. Have you started, Joel? Uh, not even like one week. Starting next week. Have you guys started school yet? 
Not yet? Okay, well, it's coming soon, right? So one of the things that we're going to talk about today, but also that's important for school, is words. <coughs> words are important, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So I had intended on bringing a dictionary in with me, <coughs> and when I went to look for my dictionary, I couldn't find it. But I found this one, which is a little different. It's a sign language dictionary, which I use when I do sign language interpreting, because sometimes there's a word I may not know how to sign. And then I thought about this one, so I pulled this one out, a little dusty, I haven't used it in a little while. It's a dictionary for the Bible. Do you guys, when you read the Bible, do you ever come across a word that you don't know? Maybe, possibly. Let's see. All right, what's a newsy? Anybody? Just a random one. Um, it's the excavations. It's a place. The excavations at Newsy and adjacent mounds near Kirkuk, Iraq. Let's see if we can come up with another one. It's kind of a little bit more fun. Uh, oh, here we go. I'm not even sure if I know how to say this one, you guys. Gamaliel. It's Hebrew for reward of God. He was also the son of Petazur and a prince of the children of Manasseh, chosen to help Moses in taking the census in the wilderness. So now we've learned a couple of things today. But words are important, right? We can make a big, huge difference in what words we choose to use when we communicate with one another, right? Jesus chose his words really carefully. He also liked to use parables and metaphors, and I know that Pastor Matt talked about that before. So when we use our words, we, use, we need to make sure that we use our words carefully so that when we use our words, we share love and empathy. That's a big word. Do you guys know what empathy is? Empathy is when you think about how somebody might feel in a situation, how you might feel in that situation, and then give the love that you would want to have given to you in that hard situation. So those are some of the things that we can think about doing as we go into this next week. As we get ready for school to start, we can think about using our words really carefully when we're out at school and out in our community doing fun stuff. Okay? All right, let's say a prayer together. God, we thank you for language. We thank you for words that give us the ability to communicate our thoughts and our emotions with one another. We ask that you would give us the right words that we can share your love with the world wherever we go. Amen. All right. Thank you guys for coming up. You can go to Sunday school. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all God's works, and whose will is ever directed to the people's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of God's unfailing grace, the ground of our hoe, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit, as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe in the Holy Spirit. <coughs> temple of our blessed Lord, to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen.
Today's scripture reading comes from the New Revised Standard Version, an epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak. This ends today's reading of God's holy words. Thanks be to God. We have prayer requests this morning for all the people in the East under storm warnings for Hurricane Henry. And for the people of Afghanistan, especially the women. I would also ask that we continue to pray for the communities in Haiti as they continue their efforts of recovery from the earthquake. And from Clara Hill, we request prayers for Michelle, who is fighting bone cancer. Will you pray with me? Gracious, loving God, we ask that you would surround all of those whom we have named, both out loud and in our hearts. Grant them your peace and comfort. Cover them with your grace and your mercy. Let them know that you are with them through all things and in all ways. Amen. Now I invite you to take a moment to be in silent prayer. Listen for God's word in your hearts. Gracious God, we are grateful for this opportunity to share this time together. We ask that you would surround those here with us today and those not present with us. Continue to share with us your will that we may be your people serving you on this earth. Continue to glorify us that we may glorify you in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give 
us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And in the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. dedicate these gifts and the gifts of our time and service. May you guide these gifts that they may be directed in ways that will bring your kingdom here on earth. Through Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Will you pray with me before I deliver this message? Gracious God, bless these words. Be with those who hear them, and may they stir in us anew. Amen. Yesterday morning, the sermon was finished, but it wasn't what I wanted it to be. So as I deadheaded my daisies in the garden, I had a conversation in my thoughts about the act of deadheading a plant. What are we doing? Why do gardeners do this? Well, most of you are gardeners and you know that it's to let go of what's used up or not thriving. We cast off the pieces that don't bring the beauty or usefulness the parts that take up energy without giving back. In the recent past, I have had to deadhead my life. During the time in my garden yesterday, I realized it was good for me to let these things go. Sometimes deadheading our lives is removing things that don't benefit us. Sometimes it's pausing and looking at the bigger picture to see exactly which way to go forward. And in all of these, we have Paul's lesson for today. It was around 62 CE, approximately 30 years after Christ's crucifixion and resurrection, that Paul wrote a letter to the church in Ephesus an agricultural and trade community in South Asia Minor. The portion of the letter that we read today is the peroration or closing remarks. Some of the unique aspects of this epistle over others that Paul wrote is the general language that is used. This letter is written to a larger, more general population of people. And there are excerpts from this that are debated as being directly pulled from previously written letters to the Colossians and the Philippians. But more than anything, this is a cry of hope and for hope, written from a person in prison facing a death sentence. A little backstory Ephesus was a pagan town. The main temple there was for the worship of Artemis. Now part of temple worship for the peg what part of temple worship for the pagan gods was to have idols in your homes. So the idol makers of Ephesus banded together and created a fuss over Paul's teachings and the resulting conversions which had then caused a huge reduction in the need for idols capitalism at its finest. Because of this reaction and the possible danger to himself and the church, Paul left. Now in that time period, Roman leadership had outlawed Christianity, and an act of defiance of this law was punishable by death through stoning or crucifixion. So when Paul's ministry caught up to him in Asia Minor, he went to Jerusalem, where he was then arrested and sent to Rome for trial. And this letter was most likely written from the prison in Rome, where Paul was waiting to know his fate. In the time of the early church, there was indeed a lot of true persecution, imprisonment, punishment by torture, and execution were not uncommon. We as Christians living in the United States don't face this reality today, but we do face other issues. In the larger community scale, we face climate change, racism, sexism, especially against our LGBTQ family, xenophobia against our Jewish and Muslim neighbors, and currently we face ignorance 
and mistrust of the scientists and medical professionals who work to protect us from the pandemic. Individually, we each face different things that could be attacks against our faith. Maybe a lack of self-esteem, job issues, anxiety, greed and overcollecting, or it could be health-related. But for each of us, for each of these, we can use Paul's teaching to strengthen ourselves. Jesus taught us to love one another as God loved us, to care for others without condition, and to live a life of empathy and compassion. Live in a way that we love people into loving themselves and those around them as much as possible. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul says to take up the armor of God in preparation for defense against the evil of that day. At first reading, this could be a literal call to arm yourself for a coming war, civil or otherwise. But that's not what Paul was speaking to. We can stay faithful without owning any weapons or armored clothing. Much like Jesus' parables, Paul uses metaphors. The evil of the day. That is whatever in life is attacking you, making you doubt God, perhaps causing you to feel small, insignificant or of less value. So Paul gives us these self-help guides in the form of armor and a weapon. This armor is the armor of knowledge, justice, and faith. This is the armor against darkness, as Paul says. But this darkness isn't a demon or an evil creature waiting to stalk us like prey. It's the darkness of our spirituality. It's our lack of faith. It's our not knowing or not allowing ourselves to know God with all of our hearts. The greatest weapon against that is to learn all we can about our connection and relationship with God. In understanding this, we will understand a depth of love we've never known. To have our relationship with God and Christ so that we will be able to face all the evil in all the days. Because Paul knew, as we all know, that temptation and sin isn't a one-time event. It's a constant barrage against us. Be wealthier, be smarter, wear this clothing brand, use that brand, keep up with these people. We need this protection for ourselves and also to have the strength within us to lovingly support others as they face their own attacks. Excuse me. Let's put on our armor. The belt of truth. We shall not lie, bear false witness, or be deceitful to others or to ourselves. Honesty should be at the forefront of all we do. Being honest with oneself is the first step in being able to be honest with others. Truth also recognizes that in its being told, kindness and care should be given. Truth, when shared with grace and love, can make even the bitterest pill swallowable. The chest plate is next. This is the peace that protects our heart and soul. This is the plate of justice, the part of us that knows right from wrong and that pushes and strives for that which is right 
to be equally offered to all of creation. This is what pulls us to support the anti-racism work in our communities, to help release the undocumented from the cages at the borders, and especially to love those whom society finds unlovable. Now we put on our shoes. John Wesley, in his explanatory notes upon the New Testament, for this verse states, let this be always ready to direct and confirm you in every step. Wesley believed that it is through the scripture as the foundation of life that we should be guided. So to wear the gospels as our shoes is to walk by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The shield is the shield of faith. With faith, we are reminded of the grace, compassion, empathy, and love that God has given through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Through faith, we are protected against those things that would shoot us down in life. Next, we put on the helmet, a full coverage piece that will protect the most vital part of our body. The helmet is the helmet of salvation. This is the wisdom of the promise of God. This is not the wisdom of, I know more than you, but rather the wisdom of quiet vigilance in compassion and the wisdom that gives us empathy that ability to place ourselves in our hearts into another person's situation so that we might care for them. The wisdom that through Christ we have been forgiven and will have salvation. It is knowing that God is with us always and that through God we are called to be a loving presence in the world. The sword of the spirit. This is not a sharp edged weapon of killing, but rather are the words as presented to us in the word, Jesus Christ. But swords, even metaphorical ones, require action from us. And so it is the actions we take through the Holy Spirit guiding us that wield this sword. With our armor now on, we note that our backs are bare, reminding us that we must always face that which is attacking. We walk into the hard places of life with God surrounding us and leading us as we look things in the eye. Our armor is on, we're ready to go out and to live as Christ's army, but then Paul stops us. Like a good general, he reminds us of the key to success in our mission. And so we are reminded to pray. There's two parts to this. The first is to, re to maintain our relationship with God. No relationship can last or have depth to it or strength in it if it doesn't have good communication. So we must be in constant communication with God, both private and public, silent and vocal. We each of us need to spend time talking with, not to or at, but with God. That means listening, too. But also, Paul is specifically asking that we pray for him, for his ministry, that though he is facing his own likely execution, he will be able to carry out all he has just laid out for us, that he, too, will be able to wear this armor and wield this sword, that the church his ministry, and the glorious message of the good news will continue on even after he is gone. Paul maintains hope 
among the hopeless. In this letter, Paul demonstrates a faith and hope that is so deep that it reaches out from a prison cell lingering with the weight of impending execution and offers hope to a people thousands of miles away, months of travel time between them. And through the ongoing hope of others throughout all the years between then and now, we too receive this message. In a time when things seem less than hopeful for us, we are reminded through Christ's loving acts, through God's compassion and grace, we are all people of hope amongst the hopeless. We have the guidance of the shoes of the gospel directing our steps. We carry the shield of faith, protecting our heart, that we may be brave enough to share it. And the sword of the Holy Spirit guiding our actions and our words in life, we can offer that same hope to those around us as they find themselves feeling hopeless. We can share with them the love that God has promised all of us. There's a famous quote that I love and I had always believed was attributed to the Franciscan order founder, St. Francis of Assisi. But I learned recently it wasn't actually his quote. So I leave you now with this unattributed guidance to do the sharing of God's love by sharing the gospel every day, and when necessary, use words. Amen. you. Go in peace and grace and mercy and carry it with you into the world. Amen.